Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and I'm going to call this meeting to order. The first item on the agenda is the Executive yeah. Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A few brief announcements. As a reminder, we're accepting public comment on One Care Vermont's ACO FY22 budget and 2022 certification until this Friday, December 17th, close of business, in order to be considered ahead of a potential Green Mountain Care Board vote, which is tentatively scheduled for next Wednesday, December 22nd. And also an ongoing public comment that we've had up since February of this year, and that is for anyone interested in um, sharing any public comment on a next potential agreement with the uh, with CMMI and CMS for a, a future all peer model agreement. Uh, any of those comments up to date, we and in the future, we will share with our colleagues at AHS and at the governor's office as they will be leading the negotiations. And then a uh, scheduling reminder this evening, we will uh, be at, we'll be having the primary care advisory group meeting, which starts at 5 p.m. and that's via Teams. Uh, VMS will be presenting their primary care platform for prioritization. And that's a lot of alliteration. It's a nice name there. <laughs> um, so that should be interesting. Those materials are on our website as well under the primary care advisory group. And then next week, we uh, have a potential vote scheduled for One Care Vermont's budget, as I mentioned earlier. We also have a potential vote scheduled for the Medicare benchmark proposal for uh, 2022, which you'll hear about today. And then we also have um, a potential vote on the calendar for the all peer model agreement proposal to request one year extension. That's also on our calendar today. So if we don't get to it today, we have that noticed for next week. Uh, and at this point, we don't have anything scheduled for the 29th, um, but that is listed as TBD. So I will turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, December 8th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, December 8th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Um, is there any further discussion? And Michelle Degree, if I could just ask you to mute your line, we're getting feedback. Okay. Any further discussion on the um, minutes of Wednesday, December 8th? If not, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the minutes were approved unanimously. Next up on the agenda is the 2022 Medicare benchmark proposal. And at this point, I'll turn the meeting over to Sarah Lindbergh. Uh, good afternoon, board. Uh, my name is Sarah Lindbergh. I head up the data team here for the Green Mountain Care Board. And I am here to talk about the Medicare benchmark. Most importantly, is everyone able to see my screen? We can. All right, fantastic. So uh, please let me know if I'm starting to go too quickly as always. Uh, but I just wanna start off by saying that um, this year's as tricky as it has been for the last couple. So I'll do my best to make it as a little clearer than mud. Uh, so we're gonna start by just reminding ourselves what's up with these benchmarks, talking about the background, what the experience has been to date and then go into what I'm recommending for the 22 benchmarks. So, always good to keep in mind that there are multiple agreements in place underneath this big all-payer model umbrella. So the Vermont all-payer ACO agreement, which I usually will call the agreement, is the one between um, CMS, the Medicare agency, and the state of Vermont. And so the signatories for the state of Vermont include the Green Mountain Care Board, the Agency of Human Services, and the governor's office. Now completely separately, but 
entirely related are the contracts the ACO has, um, both with payers for the target setting, like we're talking about today, and with the providers, who are the ones who are actually providing care and attributing patients to the model. So the agreement that the state has with CMS gives the GMCB the authority, including some duties in setting the financial targets between in the contract between the ACO and Medicare, known as the participation agreement. Always need to remind ourselves that what we do is we propose targets and then CMS has the option to either approve those targets or can request their modification. Unfortunately, there aren't any standards listed by which they make that assessment. So uh, that, that is it under their discretion. Another confusing piece of this puzzle is that um, for Medicare purposes, the all-inclusive population-based payment, or AIPBP, is calculated and reconciled completely independently from these financial benchmarks. Um, the AIPBP for Medicare is designed to provide a stable funds flow to providers um, that we do our best to get it right, but that's based on the amount of care expected to be delivered to attributed beneficiaries by um, participating providers who opt for that payment arrangement. However, um, for the ACO's purposes, their total cost of care is comprise, it comprises the fee-for-service payments made like the old days, so people who aren't participating in AIPVP, so that might be out of state, that might be in-state providers who don't do that payment arrangement, plus what would have been paid under fee-for-service that are associated with these AIPVP claims. So um, if you want to look at how it's sugared out so far in 2021, the solid line are the fee-for-service equivalents, those would have been paid amounts, that the ACO um, population has incurred, and the dashed line um, is that those AIPBP payments. So um, most months, the fee-for-service equivalents have been under that. There's been a few months that we've gone over, which is unusual, especially that time of year, which is a little indicator of how wonky 2021 has been. Um, but at the end of the day, this will be a completely separate reconciliation. This is this is really more of an issue. <clears throat> So uh, the benchmark, as we're going to talk about it today, really has three major components. There's the historical experience. So that's what we think the um, per member per month or PMPM will be for 2021 based on who's participating in 2022. So it's not the actual 2021 population. It's who, um, we, who would have attributed last year um, if the 22 ACO network was in place. We also uh, multiply that by the number of people who will be attributed in the upcoming year. And today is the GMCB's decision and how we trend that. So that is what do we think a reasonable target and growth rate is from 2021 to 2022. And that's how we get to our benchmark. And in Medicare, one of the ways that we help with mitigating some of the risk is that there are actually two benchmarks. One is for um, folks, beneficiaries who are eligible for Medicare due to end-stage renal disease or ESRD, um, and then the rest of the population. So there aren't a whole lot of beneficiaries uh, in the model who qualify this way. However, they are substantially more expensive, so having them have a separate target and reconciliation process um, provides a little protection um, to people participating in this model. And so the agreement has certain duties assigned to the Green Mountain Care Board in setting these targets. Um, and one of the criteria in those duties is that the trend be set at least 0.2 percentage points lower than the national proje projections <laughs> released for the Medicare fee-for-service uh, population nationally each year. Um, so normally that letter would come out in April. So for 2022, we would have normally expected the letter to come in in April of 2021. However, um, the, the real kind of intent for these projections is for people who are trying to set targets and premiums for their Medicare Advantage business. And due to all the uncertainty, there was real pressure to get these estimates out as soon as possible. And so the letter was actually released in January of 2022. So that might introduce a little bit even more uncertainty into these projections than there normally is. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, you know, guessing 2021 today 
is not clear to me. So guessing it back in January would have been even f fuzzier. So just want to keep in mind that these projections um, have a, a ton of uncertainty more than ever before. So, so the do you expect oh. them to return to April this coming year, or do you think it, uh, it will be another year of an early release? I have not heard any um, leaning one way or the other, but my my hunch is it'd be more like April. I think people are are interested in more information at this point, but um, hard telling, not knowing. So uh, these are have been the trend limits to date. Um, so because nothing is ever simple with this model and agreement, <clears throat> in 2018, there was a special provision um, that said if the growth rate was in a certain range, that the Green Mountain Care Board would have the option to use something called the floor, which was using um, a, a growth target of 3.5%. So that was the limit of the growth in 2018 due to the observed growth from 2017 to 2018, which was actually more like 2.7%. Um, the limits in 2019 were 3.8% and 3.1%. Again, prospective limits for 2020 were 4.0 and 2.9. We know that that's not the way 2020 went at all. Um, and then, so again, those, those January estimates for growth for 2021 were 4.4 and 2.3. Those are turning out to look pretty darn low in my estimation. Um, and then in 2022, they're projecting really high growth. So they're projecting a 10.4% growth rate for non-ESRD and a 7.6% for ESRD. Now, um, everywhere I've looked indicates that these are pro probably pretty um, high estimates. Um, but again, they were doing the best they could back in January for um, you know almost two years later. Um, at the end of the day, the Green Mountain Care Board is needs to keep its Medicare growth under um, a compounding annual growth rate from 2017 to 2022. That's as it's written today, no factoring in for the extension yet, um, which means our target would be 5.2% for the non-ESRD population and 3.9% for the ESRD. Um, we have no risk of coming close to those. Uh, the, the 2020 has done a number, um, so I'm not I'm not stressing about that. But I wouldn't recommend that coming into your thoughts about this. So what has the board decided so far? So in 2018, as I already mentioned, uh, the board chose to um, use that floor provision in the agreement. So the trend rate was 3.5%. In 2019, the board chose to use the maximum allowable trend rates, which was 3.8 for the non-ESRD population and 3.1 for the ESRD benchmark. And in 2020, uh, we ended up revising our proposal and reverted to a retrospective trend just to see, um, due to all the uncertainty, we weren't sure where things were going to sugar out. And so that um, observed trend rate from 2019 to 2020 was minus 7.7% for the non-ESRD population and minus 2.2% for the ESRD population. We won't be able to calculate the 2021 growth rate until um, we have full run out but we do expect that to be likely um, a double digit growth rate um, for both population. Well, I'm sorry, for the ESRD population. Um, ESRD has been a lot more stable, which makes sense. Their care is gonna be a lot less sensitive um, to the pandemic. There's, there's a lot of care they need um, no matter what. Um, so what do you do with a problem like 2020? Um, I wish I could solve that in a musical, but unfortunately there's no good answers here. So. Um, what we do know is that 2020 is kind of garbage in terms of target setting. It's it's meaningless. Uh, there, there's not really any a lot to gather there because um, uh, for obvious reasons. And so as a result of that, um, a lot of programs are choosing to base their 22 rates on 2019 claims. So that also introduces additional uncertainty. You still have to trend it somehow. However, you're at least starting from a base that makes some sense <laughs> to people. Um, however, uh, CMS had a strong preference that we um, impute the 2020 experience for our modeling, um, which means that um, instead of uh, relying on what actually happened to the reference population, which is the uh, dark solid line, they said, well, you know, if we were basing this on traditional Medicare claims, you know, what would their experience looked have looked like? Um, and so that gets the dash line. So any modeling that was done by CMS um, involved that imputed information. So that means that um, 2020 doesn't go down 
in in the model. It just looks like a, a any old year when we stick it into our modeling. So, um, again, a lot of uncertainty is still um, to, <laughs> to be unfolded. Um, but if we look at our all payer. Uh, total cost of care, which is the what the range of 3.5 to 4.3 percent growth, it, the model um, is centered around achieving. Um, I would say that based on what I know, we still have to finalize the repricing for 2020 um, for our Medicaid hold harmless provision. But um, I would say that we're probably looking at a range of 500 to 510 dollars per member per month. So obviously quite a dip from the 542 um, at the end of 2019. Um, and then 2021 is, is really a mystery. So, you know, there's a, a big um, gap in where that might land. But um, despite all that uncertainty, we, we are pretty <laughs> confident we've got quite a margin uh, for the all payer target. So I would say that, um, you know, from 2021 to 2022, our kind of headroom is between 5.5 and 16.7%. That's a huge range. Um, it's the best I can do. Uh, there's a lot of people making great guesses out there, um, but if they have a narrower range, I, I, I don't know that I would trust it anymore. <laughs> this is an honest assessment of the uncertainty, in my opinion. And so uh, if we look at how Medicare has grown over time, um, the bottom line here, the solid one, that's uh, the dark blue is what um, Vermont's actuals have been coming in at. And the solid line, um, the furthest north is the U.S. actual. And I, I just, I always want to just mention that Vermont is an incredibly efficient state for its Medicare population. Like these are incredibly, um, you know, I think we don't get enough credit for like these numbers. Like I think that they're they're impressive. <laughs> so I just always want to make sure that we keep that in mind because growth rates can. Uh, mask that really um, important point. Um, and splitting the difference there in the dashed lines are, so the projections, like I said, are released every year. So this is what the historical trend and projections have looked like according to the 2022 announcement. So um, as you can see, everyone takes their nosedive in 2020. You will also notice that Vermont took a more substantial nosedive than U.S. Um, I believe that that's almost entirely due to the fact that we did not have a lot of expenditures related to COVID. So we deferred more care and had less treatment expenses than, I, than was observed nationally. Um, you know, there's other reasons for that as well. Um, we, you know, we often have snowbirds, so this would include care that was potentially delivered out of state in Florida. I think that was less true in 2020. So there's a lot of things to unpack, but um, relatively speaking, Vermont's uh, decrease was greater in 2020. Um, so again, you know, it's always hard to think about trends and growth rates for me, but um, here we have what the growth rate has been for that Vermont actual, the dark blue solid line, the light blue solid line is the um, actual growth rates for the U.S. population annually, and then the projected growth rates. So um, right now we see that there is projected a pretty huge increase for 2021. That's about probably what we're going to be expecting um, this year, but they are also expecting a pretty substantial growth rate in 2022. That's that 10.6%. Um, and then they have it kind of calming down after that a little bit into more historic ranges. <clears throat> um, so when it comes to being attributed to the ACO for the Medicare program, we have to remember that we're, we have got, um, we've got some bias in who's going to be attributed. So they, they seek care, they've got primary care claims, so they, they tend to be a more expensive utilizer <clears throat> type population, excuse me. <clears throat> And we're also going to be limited to the types of providers that participate in this model. So we kind of have it from both sides. So, for instance, if people are majority of their primary care relationship is with Dartmouth Hitchcock in Medicare, we're not missed picking up those lives today. So the top dash line is what we call the prospective alignment. This is what we measure for scale purposes. So that's when we apply the attribution algorithm to the claims for two years prior to the um, upcoming performance year. That's how many people would attribute to the model. 
Um, and then at settlement, we see who maintained their eligibility for either the full performance year or up to the point at which they passed away. And so that's why you see a drop between who's included for settlement purposes and who um, is prospectively aligned. Now, those lines have very different trends um, in 18 and 19 than the relationship in 20 between the two. And that is 100% um, due to the Medicare Advantage penetration rate. So we expect that um, 2021 will probably be, um, you know, the latest estimate I saw was probably going to be closer to 42,000. And we seem to be losing more lives uh, every month due to people taking up that plan. And then also, uh, similarly, 2022 um, is likely to continue that trend, where as more and more people um, sign up for those uh, options in the state. But these are um, factoring in the known exclusions to date. And that is one change we made for the benchmark today is that um, usually we would put the 62,711 in the benchmark, but we said that's that's just not true. We already know we're down to almost 52,000. So we're gonna use the number we know um, so far. <clears throat> So one cares results to date. So uh, this, these are each of the first three performance years. So uh, the bottom bucket are the fee for service claims. Um, the top bucket are those that were paid through AIPBP. Um, so that is the fee for service equivalents for services that were actually delivered. Um, and anything that was different from what was prospectively paid was reconciled elsewhere. So the dashed red lines show what their target was. And you can see that um, in 2018, uh, the ACO was about $14 million below the target. Um, and this is just for performance. There's other things that happen at settlement. Um, in 2019, they were $2.4 million above their target. And in 2020, the spending ended up being $27 million below the target. Obviously, um, 2020, really isn't about performance so much as it is um, just a crazy pandemic year. Um, so, you know, that one is what it is, but I think uh, I think it's always important to separate out the performance uh, targets from the rest of it. So uh, when it comes to actual settlement, this is why I was saying it's a little bit of a different picture. So uh, the top line here is showing what the gross um, savings or losses were for the ACO. That includes um, the advanced payments that were made to fund the blueprint and SASH programs. So uh, below that is what the cap is on the gross savings and losses, and the cap is a proportion of the benchmark. So it was in 2018, it was a 5% corridor. In 2019, it was a 5% corridor with 80% um, risk sharing within that corridor. So um, this is just the, the total corridor. So that's the cap. So when we apply the cap, you're either going to you're going to have the lesser of um, either the gross savings or the cap on the savings. So the cap really has only come into play so far in 2020, which makes sense. Um, then there is a quality adjustment. 2018 and 2020 were um, really paying for measures, so there really wasn't a meaningful uh, adjustment. So 2019 was the only year that we actually applied any sort of quality adjustment. And then again, that ACO risk arrangement is the risk inside the corridor. So once we adjust for that, um, the gross final savings in 2018 was um, 14 million. It was 11.3 million in 2019 and 16.3 million in 2020. Um, however, part of those savings were advanced, um, again, to help with cash flow to fund the Blueprint for Health and SASH. So when you factor that into the equation, the ultimate check to the ACO is in bold in the last line there. So ranging from 4.9 to 7.9 million over time. Now, uh, this is, again, a completely different exercise from reconciling the AIPBP. This is just based on the risk and the financial targets. So that, that's a different equation that's not factored in here. Um, so <laughs> I, I can't overstate the amount of uncertainty there is right now, um, you know, between hospitals being full, the intensity and number of services that are being produced, and then at the same time, the focus on necessary care and additional um, deferral of um, elective services, which is always a, a 
controversial thing to think about. But um, right now, our estimates for Q4 are 861. I, if I were a betting man, which I'm not, I'd say that's going to go up. Um, and I would have seen estimates uh, ranging from a PMPM of 815 to 860 for 2021. So that's just an incredible amount of uncertainty to have this time of year. Usually we feel a lot more confident about where it's going to land. Um, so, you know, that's not really a trend decision. I just want to be clear. That's like an experience estimate that we can get right. We we can fix that and, and see where 2021 actually lands. But um, I just want to be clear that that's a, a known unknown, as I will talk about in a minute here. So again, that experience for 2021, the base might be wrong. So we um, are going to run numbers after we have three months of run out for the calendar year. So that'll be around April of next year. And if it's wrong, we're going to update it. So uh, if, if we've got it wrong, we will totally update that and make sure that we're starting from a fair place. Um, another known risk is that if the public health emergency on the federal level were to expire, that might take with it some of the flexibilities that are currently um, allowed in the ACO program. Most notably right now, um, expenses associated with COVID-19 episodes are removed from the ACO's total cost of care. So if those were to come back in uh, to the ACO's accountability, we would need to adjust the benchmarks to make sure that um, we're, we either account for that in the experience, add those expenses back into the experience, or adjust the trend if we think that um, the expenses associated with treatment are not comparable to the baseline period. So um, that's something we're monitoring closely. Similarly, um, uh, there is a very expensive Alzheimer's drug. I'll add, <laughs> I won't try and embarrass myself and pronounce it. Uh, however, uh, if so they are gonna take up whether or not they will cover that starting in April of this coming year. Um, if that were approved by Medicare, which is definitely not a given, given some of the controversy around it, um, we would definitely make sure that that was accounted for and that the ACO would not be accountable for expenses that they are not um, in their base at all. Um, but that's uh, probably unlikely to fold out in 2022, uh, we're hoping, but um, you know, we will cross that bridge. <laughs> um, and these are the ones that are kind of keeping me up nights in terms of setting the trend, and, and that is... So the Medicare Advantage penetration rate, we expect to, to increase again in January. And if uh, what we have seen to date continues, that might just really change fundamentally the population left in traditional Medicare. And so if that happens, we're going to have to address it. Um, also, with our capacity um, at maximum, um, people are trying to are having to make referrals that they wouldn't otherwise. Um, and those um, are, I, in my judgment, unavoidable expenses um, that we need to account for if, uh, if that ends up being a problem in 2022. Um, the deferred care, that's a, that's a tough one because foregone care and deferred care so far have kind of been netting out in all the actuarial modeling I've seen, but um, we have to keep an eye on it. it. It just might still be coming. So if it seems like, especially the intensity of the care, is increasing and increasing the expenses. We will need to make an adjustment for that. And then, of course, um, COVID-19 is, is a very difficult thing to, to predict. So if there are um, either immediate or related effects that um, are affecting the trend, we will need to adjust it as well. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, what we need to do is, is make sure we're monitoring 2022 closely. And if any of these things suggest that a revision of the trend is required or necessary, um, that we would do that um, with the, you know, with in consultation with CMS. I think we can make a proposal at any point, um, but uh, we're pretty good at partnering and, and making sure to keep things uh, as reasonable as possible from our agreement standpoint. So when I was looking at the problem of uh, what's going to happen from 2021 to 2022, I was trying to imagine who's going to have the best, most recent information about what's going to happen in 2022. And that led me to review um, the Medicare premium announcements. So the every year in the Federal Register, um, they announce how the premiums for both Part A and Part B are going to um, be projected to increase for the coming year. They released them in November, which is about as late in the year as you can get um, a guess from Medicare about the next year. 
And uh, what I did is I blended together um, part A and part B, and then part B actually has components for the disabled and non-disabled populations. And when I do that, um, you know, it, it's it's been pretty in line um, with the other um, Medicare Advantage announcements um, and, you know, tracking pretty closely with um, what we're seeing in Vermont. So, for instance, if you look at the experience from 2018 to 2019, Vermont actually uh, grew at 4.1% and the U.S. at 4.1%. The call letter had expected a 4% growth and the Medicare premiums were expected to grow by 4.4%. So, um, you know, that looks pretty good to me. 2020, we can't blame anybody about that. That was ahead of time. It, those are totally reasonable guesses at the time. Um, but where it's interesting to me is in the growth from 20 to 21, that's where the call letter, um, so th again, this would be the call letter from April of 2020 for growth to 2021. They um, only showed a growth rate of 4.5%. And I believe that's because they expected some of the care to start coming back in 2020. So again, they have to release theirs substantially earlier. Um, so you know, that one to me just seems wrong, whereas the Medicare premiums look a lot more reasonable, 9.2% um, growth. And so um, I think that's part of what's going on in this dis discre uh, discrepancy between their predict pro projections for 2022, because if you net out the growth for this whole time period, they both end up in about the same place. So I think that um, essentially the, the call letter got it wrong in 2021 and, and um, some of that's making up in 2022. But um, that said, uh, it's, it's, it's a guessing game. <laughs> it's, no one knows what's going to happen in 2021, which is why the monitoring is, is essential. Uh, so I just wanted to show you kind of the menu um, available to the board. So um, the left hand rows are showing you kind of the range of potential experience estimates for 2021. That's not anything for you to decide on. That's just like kind of giving you um, some some context for how these things would sugar out depending on the experience, just for kind of reference. Um, the Green Mountain Care Board's decision is really across the columns. So um, using a 3.5% trend, which is the, you know, the, the floor of growth according to the agreement, um, according to our current estimate of experience, um, the, the, the target for the ACO would be $856 uh, per person per month with a risk corridor of $10.9 million. And uh, I would say, I mean, <laughs> please don't go anywhere below that. Uh, that that would be nuts. <laughs> so that would uh, what I would call the floor of a potential decision. And the ceiling again is according to the agreement and according to the letter that would bring the per member per month target up to nine hundred and thirteen dollars, and um, bring the risk corridor up by um, eleven point nine million. Or I'm sorry, bring it up by one million to plus or minus eleven point nine million. So. You'll notice that these numbers, despite big changes in trend, aren't changing the risk a lot, and that's because of a 2% corridor. Um, so the risk corridor is really going to constrain this quite a bit. Um, and so my recommendation in the middle is a 5.5% trend, and that's based on that Medicare premium that I explained, and that would result in a PMPM of 873 um, with a risk corridor um, of $11.1 .1 million. Uh, so, uh, but I mean, I think, you know, the, yeah, uh, with the risk corridor as tight as it is, there's not a lot that's going to happen for that ultimate, um, plus or minus, uh, for the ACO. Um, the target needs to be adequate and fair. Um, and, you know, I think anyone's guess is as good as mine for where that might actually end up. But, Given what I know today, I would recommend a 5.5% trend um, for both the non-ESRD and ESRD changes, but um, certainly in our proposal to CMS, uh, make sure that these guardrails are in, in place, and that is that we um, you know, monitor both the 2021 experience to make sure that stays accurate and uh, keep our tabs on what's happening in 2022, and that if there are material changes to either benefits or protections in place uh, during the performance year that those are reflected somehow in the benchmark. That said, 
if everything goes off the rails again and we're back in 2020 kind of uncertainty levels, like I would uh, advise that we uh, propose a retrospective trend and, um, you know, both CMS and the ACO understand that that is um, completely on the table and uh, that despite our best efforts, it's just uh, very tough sledding out there when it comes to trying to predict anything. <clears throat> All right, so that's the trend. Uh, so this other little tack on is related to advancing the shared savings. So um, as a reminder, uh, Vermont has a um, pretty well-regarded program known as the Blueprint for Health, and that includes payments associated with primary care medical homes, community health teams, um, and peripherally we have some investments in support and services at home or SASH. And uh, those funding, that funding for Medicare stopped in 2016 when the uh, MAP-CP uh, demonstration ended. So the all-payer model included um, some provisions that, to continue that funding by Medicare. So the, one of the only ways to get the money to the state is uh, to put it in the benchmark. And the way that it works mathematically is it's not really performance risk, it's just tacked on. Um, but it is reconciled at settlement. So mathematically, what you're deciding on is that first kind of equation in parens, specifically the trend. So that gets all figured out. And then at the very end, they add on the shared savings. So the performance risk is, is separated from this blueprint <laughs> stuff. And so um, my concern is that using a 2% corridor is, again, going to constrain the total amount of shared savings possible. So given the increasing Medicare Advantage penetration, it's possible that the people left at the time of settlement might so severely constrain the savings that there's a scenario where the ACO would not even be able to earn back that advanced savings. Um, this is an uncomfortable position for everyone, um, and that is one of the main reasons that we are looking for alternatives, ways to fund this um, as next year and beyond. So. Um, if I have any power in this, this will be the last year that we're, we're faced with this unfortunate um, kind of arrangement. Um, but just for, to, I do better with pictures sometimes. So um, the line going across is that advance of the 9.1 million um, that uh, you may order the ACO to invest in those programs. So if you look at a 2% risk corridor, um, the margins are very narrow. So the darker, blue, taller ball uh, bars are, um, kind of what the risk corridor looks initially. Um, the lighter green uh, shorter bars are what we would estimate at settlement. Um, this is based on basically a 25% attrition rate, which is what we saw um, for the reference population for the current benchmark. Uh, I would guess it's probably gonna go down even lower. So those margins are gonna get thinner. Um, so there, I just think that that's a real risk that might occur and something to monitor if the ACO does elect a 2% corridor, which, you know, these these risk, these maximum potential savings are also maximum potential losses. So I know it's an uncomfortable time to think about taking on additional risk, but um, I, I do think if there were appetite, you know, to increase the corridor by half a percent, that would give them a lot more um, breathing room for avoiding that possibility, but that's 100% their decision. The Green Mountain Care Board's decision is at the bottom, and that is those risk corridors, uh, I'm sorry, those trend rates uh, for the benchmark. But again, you'll notice that those um, trend rates are moving the bars much less than the risk corridor. So the risk corridor is just a lot more powerful way to influence this than the, the trend rate. Um, and is really a separate issue, but I just wanted to kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about. So um, I would recommend, um, per the preference of the ACO, that the full amount that you order be uh, advanced in the Medicare benchmark, which I think I got my math right, um, and that you would continue to use those to support the state programs. I'm sure you're sick of hearing me talk by now, so what questions can I answer? So questions, so questions for Sarah? Sarah? I have, a, I have a couple, I have a couple questions. questions. Um, could we could we go back to slide 12? It's echoing quite a bit. I'm not sure why. Yeah. Or maybe it's just on mine. No, I could I could hear the echo too, but it's it's better now. Yeah. 
Um, so Sarah, um, I just wondered if you could, ex and maybe I missed this when you were talking, so my apologies if you said this, but could you talk a little bit more about which, I know this isn't our decision, but I'd like to understand a little bit more which programs are using the 2019 claims. Um, certainly when we were doing hospital budgets, uh, one of the things we did was go back to 2019 to try and, you know, kind of gauge a little more normality. So if you have a little bit more information about that, that would be interesting. Yeah, um, I have not, don't have any insight into what any of the um, commercial plans are doing for their 2021 program, but I do know that this is the way that um, I believe uh, Diva is expecting to go. And it also, um, just looking across the at other reform uh, demonstrations in Medicare, they're also using 19 as a reference. Thank you. Um, my other question is on slide 24. Um, so with the Medicare Advantage, I think you mentioned this, but I want to make sure I have it straight in my head. Uh, the reason why this is a risk is because you would expect folks moving to Medicare Advantage to potentially be healthier than the folks remaining in traditional Medicare which would then impact uh, the health of the ACO population. Is that, do I have that right? Yeah, it's um, the people that we're losing from Medicare Advantage during open enrollment um, tend to have yeah. uh, lower average expenditures. Okay, Yeah, Great. and part of that is they tend to be in Chittenden County, which is where um, we tend to have better, uh, lower average expenditures generally. <clears throat> okay. Um, and on the care pattern, similarly, um, we would expect that the out-of-state care might be more expensive than the in-state care. Is that the dynamic there? Yeah, and it's also um, just the additional expense of transporting people medically um, is quite substantial. Um, of course. If primary yeah. care relationships move out of state, we do have a way to protect the ACO against that with the QEM exclusion, but it's this tertiary care um, that would not necessarily go away. Okay, great. Um, I think those were uh, the immediate questions I had. I did, um, Mr. Chair, want to ask some, Sarah some questions about the discussions with CMS, which I think should be done in executive session, but maybe I should hold off on that until others have asked questions. That would make sense. Thank you, Robin. Jess or Tom? I'm happy to go. Um, unless Tom, you want to go? No. Nope. beat me to it. Okay. <laughs> um, Sarah, can I ask a couple of quick questions about the um, the 5.5 coming from Medicare premium rates. And I'm just trying to figure out, I actually was doing the same sort of calculation and just looking that up yesterday. And I noticed that um, part B premiums look like they're going up about 14.5% and part A, it's a little, it depends upon if you've got 30 quarters of experience, not 30, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, but even looking at that, Part A premiums for people who have fewer than 30 quarters of experience, you're going up 5.7%. I looked at the Part B and Part A deductibles. They're going up between 5 and 13%. So I'm trying to really figure out where the 5.5 comes from because I understand it's a weighted, some, must be some sort of weighted average that you're coming up with related to overall Medicare expenditures. Um, so anyway, if you could just back that out a little bit more detail, because, you know, the Part B was going up 14.5, so that obviously must be weighted much lower in your analysis. Um, yeah, so uh, it's not a weighting issue. If you look closely at the announcement, um, $18 of the um, the monthly costs are due to uncertainty associated with that Alzheimer's drug and okay. the ongoing uncertainty associated with the pandemic. Both of those things I um, assumed would the ACO would be sheltered from, or if not, that that would be back on the table. So that's about, um, you know, that, that was a substantial portion of the increase. Um, the other thing um, is that I only limited it to the paid amounts because that's what the contract is with the ACO and the um, 
Med, uh, the ACO and Medicare. So any cost sharing on the member's behalf uh, would be taken out of this equation. So, um, and I can totally walk you through the math and, and even present that next week so that um, I'm always happy to show my work. <laughs> yeah, that'd be really helpful. Um, that'd be super helpful. I noticed December 1st, CMS came out with Medicare spending estimates, you know, looking forward, looking for 21 to 23, and they're at 7.8%. But that's not only, you know, that's enrollees and spending. So I understand it's hard to disentangle the two. But so I'm just, you know, I was trying to figure out, are there other data points recognizing that, you know, this, uh, the call letter came out so long ago. Um, but with respect to that also, you know, we're, we're tying, we're all trying to figure out a better number um, and we're tying tying it to national trends. But I do think that we have, something unique happening in Vermont, and I'm not sure how to adjust that experience. But, and you mentioned some of them, and this, is it this slide? No, it's not this slide. It'd be like slide 17, I think might be helpful. Yeah, so one of the things that's notable about, uh, to me about, you know, slide 17 is that typically, um, you know, Vermont, if you look at it, it's, we're, the deviation between Vermont's experience and the actual experience is quite, is, is small, right? It's, but in 2020, it was larger. Nationally, it was only down 2%. In Vermont, it was down 7% in terms of Medicare growth, which could be suggestive of, you know, there were more restrictions in Vermont, there was more deferred care in Vermont, and therefore the, the pent-up demand might potentially be greater. Granted, that would be perhaps in 2021, but the reality is we're still in this pandemic. It's particularly problematic now. Deferred care we're already seeing uh, kind of being reintroduced because of capacity constraints. We also have the unique Vermont situation of really long wait times, which uh, there is hope that maybe there might be some uh, changes in 2021, 20, I mean, 2022, we know that some of the hospitals are on a hiring spree, trying to hire more specialists, UVM being one of them, you know, to the degree that some of the wait time uh, backup gets alleviated over the course of the next 18 months. This is something that's happening in Vermont, not happening necessarily nationally. Could that lead to greater growth rates in, in 2022 as some of that wait time dissipates the hopeful you know, idea that it might. And then the third kind of unique Vermont piece to me, you also mentioned is the uh, Medicare Advantage. And we have a new Medicare Advantage program coming in, in Chittenden County. And to the degree that they are gonna be siphoning off more of the lower risk population, then what's left is gonna be the higher risk expenses. So I'm guess just wondering, does it make sense to be using whatever national benchmark new or national trend rate that we might be able to use something like the 5.5, but does that make sense given some of the directional um, unique Vermont experiences suggest that we may be a little bit higher than, than the rest of the country in the upcoming year because of some of the data that we're seeing? Does that make any sense? It, it does make sense. Um... And one of the things that I kept thinking about in this is that our recovery in 2020 also didn't look like any other state. Um, you know, our while we did go down more, um, we got back to normal pretty quickly. Um, there was also a cyber attack, which is affecting some of these uh, numbers. <laughs> so hard to interpret what to do with that part of this puzzle. But um, yeah, I, I think, you know, any actuary will tell you that uncertainty means higher rates. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I think it is, it's, 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 it's a tough guess to make. So I, I, I can't tell you that I'm right, but I have factored that all in my recommendation. Okay. And then I guess my related to that um, and the degree, you know, you, you mentioned and you said this and I agree with you 100%, we can't overestimate the degree of uncertainty that we're living with here, right? Like we just don't know. So I'm just wondering, why the recommendation might not be for just going with a retrospective trend again, because we're sort of in the same place that we were last year, or maybe worse. Yeah, um, I think that the idea is that um, we keep waiting for the uncertainty to go away and, and it might be with us a lot longer than anyone hoped. And if we're, we're hoping to move to a truly capitated arrangement with Medicare, I think that this is a good way to start um, 
thinking through what that might look like, even with a ton of uncertainty. Okay. And I guess my last question involves um, the recommendation you had was for the same rate for um, NSRD and non-NSRD and when traditionally there's been a differential rate. So I'm wondering why. Um, so I, I uh, generally the, you know, ESRD is much harder to predict. Oh, sorry, ESRD. ESRD. One yeah. thing simple, yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, there, uh, I think the max rate's a little bit lower. I, I, I toyed with going the max rate there, but um, ultimately it just seemed to add more confusion than help. But yeah, uh, it, yeah, that one's just, fit. and as I said, that one's been a lot more stable. So um, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit, it's just tough. <laughs> okay. And ESRD, their population, their growth rate is stable because generally speaking, they're, under constant care, continuity of care, because they're so acutely sick that there's not less volatility in in there. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's kind of between five and seven grand, and there's just a lot of volatility no matter what. It's uh, I think 140 people have been attributed this year, so it's it's, it's very oh, few okay. people, which doesn't help. Okay, I think I'm getting it now. All right, that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Jess. Tom. So if you could flip back to uh, slide 16. So I, I just was on you. Know, I mean, the, the <laughs> try, I, I'm, I'm amazed, Sarah, that you can, you know, uh, even attempt to keep track of, of, of this margin of error and volatility. It's, it's, it's amazing. And um, I, I, when I looked at this chart, I, I kind of went back to 2018, the midpoint at 877. And then tried to trend that up to 2022 at a thousand fifty five, and that's a four point seven percent trend to try to kind of you know straighten that out, which seems to be um, in kind uh, in line with uh, you know kind of tradi the traditional growth rate. But um, through all of this uh, nuance, um, which I couldn't recite if you asked me to, through all of this nuance. At some point, the ACO has got to no negotiate contracts with providers. And um, I, I'm just wondering two things is what would you suggest to the ACO in explaining this uh, conundrum to providers uh, in the fact that there's a lot of risk there and where along this timeline will the, the least, will, will the risk be most understood? Yeah, um, so I do think moving, so one of the things that's challenging about the Medicare population is that um, it feels like you're never really sure who you're actually accountable for. And, and that's fair because, you know, you might lose a patient who ended up getting 51% of their care in Florida um, all of a sudden, so that they've been totally wiped out. So I do think the more that <clears throat> Medicare can go to a true set population or other methods to have providers have more understanding of their their panel or who they're accountable for that that would that would help a lot uh in terms of um <laughs> risk yeah it, it i think everyone's feeling it and i think when i think about risk honestly like i'm way more about risk of capacity, risk of burnout, um, risks associated with people not getting care they need. I mean, we're seeing some very sick patients right now. And so I, I really, I would not, I, I was also saying, you know, if I, I don't want this to seem like it's a, this to me is, is not really not about finances. I just want something fair that makes sense and is going to incentivize providers to make the right decisions with their patients. I think they would do that in any way, but I don't want to get in the way of those, um, those very important decisions that I know nothing about talk about nuance, but um, I don't know if I'm getting at your question, but I guess I think, uh, yeah, I, I mean, so there's a new variant that's spreading faster, but seems to be less severe. Um, it's possible that that could really clear some of this up in the next calendar year. It's possible, it's possible we'll have these COVID seasons um, and we won't know, you know, for the rest of my life year to year. So I think it's just something 
unfortunately we kind of have to wait and see and um you know but the more that we can move to stable targets for our providers and get away from kind of these claims based noise <laughs> um that would that i think that would help a lot and so we i think Medicare pays a lot of attention to Medicaid's programs, and there's some important differences in those populations to account for. But the more that we can kind of go to that unreconciled unre perspective payment in this program, um, I think that would help um, at least take a lot of these, uh, a lot of this noise out of the models, if that makes sense. It does. I, I just, I, I just wonder. Um, you know, I kind of look at fee for service sometimes as a comfortable pillow that people have been used to for a long, long time, you know, and that in a time of this kind of volatility, people tend to drift toward what they feel most comfortable with. And so that's why I asked that question about the, you know, ACO and these contracts, um, uh, whether or not fee, the old, you know, fee for service might be the best for some providers uh making them feel that's the best place to be um as opposed to a uh some some kind of a fixed perspective contract that gets reconciled i don't know yeah the, the other question i had and this this normally might be a more major question i recognize this is totally a minor note but i was looking at the draft this is not a you know a final document yet but the, the draft of our annual report and it uh <clears throat> for 2020 has the Medicare cost shift at $247 million in the, uh, for 2020 and for 2021 at $264 million. It's an increase of, you know, projected increase of $17 million. And I'm just wondering, how does that fit? How does the, the Medicare cost shift fit into the analysis that you put together? Is it embedded in the, in the trend rates? Um, yeah, so... Uh... It's a big number. Two hundred and sixty-four million dollars is a big number. It is, um, and you know, the, the model's always a little tricky because we're really we're looking at it from the payer perspective and not the provider perspective. So, I, I, you know, I think a lot. I'm I'm thinking a lot more care is probably going to end up out of state due to um, capacity constraints, and so I don't know that it's going to be the most effective tool for addressing that um, in twenty two. Well, thank you, and <laughs> you're amazing. Thank you, Tom. Sarah, can you um, go back to the slide where you had your projected range? So I, I look at uh, um, this range, and what am I missing um, when I see your recommendation at the uh, low end? Um, is something taken out of this? Oh, so this is um, all payer. So this, uh, my recommendation is just for Medicare. So this is also, in, it, it's got okay. commercial and, and Medicaid and um, the rest of it in there. Okay, so that explains that. And then can you go to the slide with the um, um, federal estimate? Uh, federal estimate. I'm, I thought it was this one. And I don't have it right. <laughs> I, I, I think that you went by it already. I, okay. thought I, I thought I heard you say that the federal estimate was for 10.6. Did I mishear that? Oh, yep, that's right. Yep. Um, yeah, so the maximum, yeah, 10.4 is the federal Medicare Advantage estimate, 7.6 for ESRD. Okay. And well, point. Two would get us to the 10.6, yeah. Correct. <laughs> and we, we have to be um, at that two tenths below. So mm -hmm. I look at that 10.4 and then I look at um, the recommendations. What am I missing there, the, the variance between the two? Yeah, so again, um, I think anyone would say that that estimate is, is quite high um, and that uh, I think the projections uh, initially were really low for 2021, and so 
the combination of the uncertainty and how their original projections were low for the current year um, are part of what explains why they are this high for 2021. So again, this estimate was made back in January of 2020. Um, I'm sorry, January of 2021 for calendar year 2022. So they were really estimating two years uh, with no data about those years uh, when they were doing these projections. And um, yeah, I think that this is really a testament to how much uncertainty the Office of the Actuary had at that point. Um, and it was designed to help uh, folks who are building Medicare Advantage rates. Um, so I think there's probably some reasons why uh, they were going to err on the high side um, for their estimates. You talked about um, you had no fears whatsoever of us uh, exceeding the uh, the agreement uh, targets. What is the cushion that we're looking at there? Yeah, so um, gosh, I don't let me get back to you on that one, Kevin, because uh, I had it and took it out of here and I don't want to misspeak. So um, the specific part of it is that range for 21 is so wide, but I can get you the range. OK, maybe you could just give it to us for next week and uh, yep. that would be helpful. Absolutely. OK, um, so at this point, um, I'll open it up for um, public comment. Is there any member of the public who wishes to comment? on the proposed uh, 2022 um, Medicare um, benchmark. So um, the first, well, I'll call on the uh, healthcare advocate first, Eric Schulteis. Thank you, uh, Chair Mullen. Um, I'm just curious with MA. So setting aside the morbidity issues and setting aside all the madness with estimating um, 2022 numbers, if Medicare penetration keeps going up, is the population of remaining aligned folks going to become so small that this potential variance is always going to be an issue moving forward, obviously not to the same extent that it is in 2022, or is it going to be negligible? Sarah, great, do you have an opinion on yeah. that? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I do think um, we probably, um, so in some states, you know, it's up to like 80%. I, I don't foresee that happening here. I, I could be wrong, but uh, I, I do think that there's some uh, kind of natural barriers that are unlikely to make the traditional fee-for-service population kind of not credible, um, but it is hard to predict. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Next, I'm going to turn to Ham Davis. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I think there's tremendous difficulties, it seems to me, to translate this work, which is very complex and detailed, but reliable. Uh, it sounds completely reliable to me, but I, the, the purposes and the use of it strikes me as a real, it, it's almost sort of a mystery. In other words, what are we actually trying to do here if we, uh, the Medicare, Medicare is going to, on as far as the provider is concerned, is going to reconcile anyway. Okay, you, you're going to get that, so they're not going to, they, they're not going to lose money there. But what I'm curious about is on slide 16, and Sarah referenced this, I, I think quite strongly that that uh, that uh, that Vermont is is very low compared to the rest of the country, and if what we've got is running room here with with Medicare uh, that you can come up to 2.2 percent, uh, was it 2.2 or 2.0? I forget. Anyway, a small amount. Um, why not get that as high as possible as that is is that doable because what that will do is it make tom happy because that would reduce the that would reduce the cost shift um it's you know, you're not going to get the full cost okay and so what one of the biggest overall sort of strategic or geopolitical problems here is is how the board can get the get the smallest hit on the on the uh on the on the private insurance rates so can you, Sarah, can you do that? I mean, 
is that is is it is it possible to do that? Does Vermont, in other words, get any reward, if you can call it that, for being as strong on on, on slide sixteen underneath the national average? Are we just are we just taking money? Are we are we negotiating with ourselves here? Are we just taking away, giving away money, and leaving it on the table? Yeah. So. Um I think those are all valid questions. They're probably questions for the board more than for me. Um, I know that this model was started because uh, Vermont was a low cost, high growth state. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just think, uh, I think they're, they're, uh, <laughs> these are complex questions, um, but you know, in my talking with folks and my doing the research, 5.5 seemed like a, reasonable recommendation. I'm not, I'm not knocking your recommendation, Sarah. I'm just trying to figure out uh, what what's what's going on here. I mean, if the the the, if, the if you take a look at these these kind of computations, um, the, there are some people that are going to be able to keep up with you. OK, and uh, and I've, they, they should be blessed. OK, but the but the but I I just absolutely don't believe that doctors on the ground are going to do anything different with their patients based on all of this analysis. They're just not, um, and the uh, because they have no idea what it is. There's no doctor out there that's going to treat a patient today that's going to have that's going to have any knowledge of or or change what he or she is going to do based on this analysis and so the question is really how, what i really i just have a lot of trouble i i but i agree with you that it's a board question yeah so, and, and you know at but, the end of the day the difference between five five and ten point four using the current estimate is you know a difference of a less than a million bucks if it, with a two percent corridor so you know i think it's in terms of incentivizing behavior change i, I don't know that that actually is gonna be what makes or breaks it and I'll say, Ham, that it kind of reinforces uh, where I was at uh, last week. Um, or maybe it was more than one week ago, I don't know. But I, I have deep concerns about the very low risk corridor. And I think that uh, we're making mistake um, by keeping that risk corridor so low. Um, Walter Carpenter. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Hamilton kind of asked a lot of the questions I had, but I wanted, and you just asked another, you just answered another one about the risk corridor. Um, <clears throat> I had one, I wanted to, Jessica mentioned the wait times, which is a great thing. Tom mentioned the risk too, which was great. Sarah is talking about how this whole benchmark thing is from the payers and the providers or for them or whatever. I want to ask, what about the patient? Because it's the patient that is paying all these numbers, the taxpayers, premium payers. And I know the board's sick of me saying it, but I'm going to keep saying it. And then I just wanted to ask, whatever happened to the wonderful thing called simplicity? <laughs> That's a great question, Walter. <laughs> if only for everything me, Kevin. Went here. But you know, that's uh, as we uh, weed through uh, um, everything and uh, work through the mud. We're trying to uh, you know make sure that the right decisions are made, and um, you know th this is not. Uh, an easy decision and at the end of the day our decision should be based on what's best for Vermonters and Vermonters are the patients. Yeah and Hamilton is right about the doctors not changing their behavior and that they don't know much about this. I'm a little nervous about the risk you know who's going to be eating it if they come in under budget or over budget or whatnot and I go back to a company that I worked for um, where 
an international company, actually, I worked for a division of it where managers got bonuses for cutting coming in under budget and thus would fire their higher and paid staff to come in under budget. And I just keep, you know, if doctors know they have to bear risk, will they cut in under the patient's care to get that and so on and so forth? That's probably a little bit above this top. Thanks for your concern, Walter. It's uh, an important question. Mike Del Truck. Oops, sorry. Good afternoon. Um, hey, Sarah, uh, great job. Um, you know, to tee off of Hamilton a little bit, uh, not everybody understands everything here, but you're really clear and you've done a really nice job. Um, my uh, questions and thoughts are, you know, tie some of the stuff together, particularly around board member Holmes's comments about where we are and what we face today as uh, Vermont um, and our hospitals and patients and everything we're experiencing. I'd like a, I, I, I'd like to ask the board contemplate how do we maximize these federal dollars? How do we how do we meet the goals of the model? And how do we help providers continue to help patients the way uh, patients deserve to be cared for? Um, you know, there's a lot of what we talked about here, but I think at the end of the day, we have to maximize that federal dollar and um, and and really take advantage of where we're at and the opportunity we have here today, and um, and maybe not even be afraid to bump up against the upper threshold of meeting the terms of the model. So. I appreciate uh, your time and hearing me out. And again, Sarah, really great job. Thanks for your comment, Mike. Next, I'll turn to Tom Boris. Hey, everyone. Uh, Tom Boris, Vice President of Finance for One Care Vermont. Uh, start by uh, echoing what Mike said around thanks to Sarah Lindberg. I think you do a, a great job. And I can empathize because th this is just really difficult times to be doing this kind of work. I mean, it's hard enough to set a target in normal healthcare times and, and we're far from nor normal healthcare times right now. So uh, appreciate the work you put in. Just a couple of quick uh, comments. I mean, to start with the risk corridor, uh, this is a tough decision, but the risk corridor in a lot of ways uh, needs to be somewhat thought of in tandem with uncertainty. If there's a lot of certainty around the target, good actuarial support, that's a condition in which you'd think about expanding the risk corridor and in, in that way, you really control your destiny a little bit more. But uh, as our actuaries coach me all the time, with greater uncertainty, you want to narrow that that risk corridor. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a rock and a hard place uh, for us, honestly, with the blueprint factor and just the general uncertainty. So for whatever it's worth, I wanted to add those those thoughts there. The other thought I'd like to add, and, and I um, intend this in a purely constructive way, but to talk about pre precision a little bit, we go through actuarial exercises with all of these payers every year, uh, and we're really talking about very uh, small adjustments that do materialize in, in, a, in a big way at the end of the day. But we have a basically a 7% span here and a 2% risk corridor, and that, that's a big span. So I think my comment is to think about really like how do we get zeroed in on a more precision in the in the process and get to a target that might have more actuarial support behind it as well to ensure it's accurate for all parties, including One Care, including Vermonters, and including the federal government. Thanks. If we could only answer that question, Tom. <laughs> Is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? If not, thank you, Sarah. You've given us a lot to digest. Kevin, uh, yes, you, I, uh, I. Oh, that's before right. Before we come yep. off this topic, I would like to make a motion to go into executive session. So don't let Sarah go yet. <laughs> um, well, I wanted okay. to thank her in open session, but. <laughs> well, please go ahead with that. And, and Sarah. Um, as everyone has said, we're always amazed by the uh, work output that uh, you put out, and um, you know uh, your your problem is that you have to uh, um, get it through some of our thick skulls on how you actually got there, and that's not easy. So um, at this point, Robin, if you have a motion, 
I do. Um, I would move that the board um, make a find uh, that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the board in the state of Vermont at a substantial disadvantage in its negotiations with uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services related to the all-payer model, which falls under 1 VSA 313A1A related to contract negotiations. Um, and also that, um, well, let's start with the finding um, and then we can move to the second part of the motion. Is there a second? Second. second. <laughs> we had a couple of delayed yeah. seconds and uh, and just um, to ex maybe just explain a little bit, uh, my questions, so that it's clear to the public, my questions relate to staff conversations with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services um, and negotiating strategy that the board uh, may want to uh, discuss. So that's, that's what I want us to talk about in an executive session. Okay, is there any further discussion? And uh, Kara, I'll ask if you could uh, put up a, a, a sign on uh, this particular uh, meeting site. And Robin, what's the expected time frame? Do you think? Um, I would say probably. Well, we do need to vote on that, and then I need to do a second motion. But I would say it um, probably fifteen between fifteen minutes and half an hour. So why don't you uh, put up a sign that we're likely to return at uh, two thirty-five, Kara? So um, I, we didn't vote on that motion yet, correct? Yeah, correct. All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. And now, Robin, for your second motion. Yeah, the second motion is that we move into executive session uh, for the purposes um, and discussion that I uh, explained uh, previously and also um, I potentially have qu questions for legal counsel um, so I would add that to the basis for going into executive session. Is there a second? Second. Okay Russ I saw that you popped up on the screen did you want to say something before we went into executive session or you're just getting ready? Nope just getting ready. Okay um, any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Okay, we'll be back at uh, sometime after 2.35. Thank you, everyone. I can now see all board members, so I'm going to uh, reconvene the meeting of the Green Mountain Care Board. And um, Does any board member have any further comments regarding the 2022 Medicare benchmark at this time? Hearing none, um, we're going to move on to. Um, Mr. Chair, this is Susan Barrett speaking. Hi. Can we announce that we are having a special public comment period? I didn't announce that before. Yes. On the 2022 benchmark, and that is until December 20th, in order to be considered for the potential vote on December 22nd. Everything is on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. So next, we're going to move to the uh, 2021 update um, to the um, health information exchange discussion, and I'm going to turn it over to Kate O'Neill. Kate. Hello. Hi. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen. Um, so you should be able to see my slides here now. Uh, thanks for having me back. We, um, we're seeing something that says can't display content. Hmm. I, I can, can see, see the slides. I see the slides. Okay, so it's just on my end. 
Let me stop. I'm going to on the website too, right? They are on the website, but I just stopped presenting and uh, let me pull it up again. Kevin, maybe it'll work this time for a you. Funky day when it comes to this. I see them now. Yes. Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, so thanks for inviting me back. Um, this is a um, so uh, just a, a brief, um, uh, I guess, recap of the 2021 update to the Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan and the 2022 Connectivity Criteria. Uh, for the record, I'm Kate O'Neill, and I'm also on the data team, and I'm the Director of Data Management Analysis and Data Integrity. So. Uh, on to slide two for just a super quick process reminder. Um, on November 1st, AHS submitted the HIE plan to the Green Mountain Care Board, and we had a special public comment period posted. Uh, and on the 17th, uh, AHS and VITAL uh, presented a summary of the HIE plan and the connectivity criteria. And uh, I provided the staff review. Uh, on December 8th, AHS resubmitted a revised HIE plan um, and then we posted that plan to the Green Mountain Care Board website and then we're here today for me to provide some uh, final recommendation to the Green Mountain Care Board and I'm going to go through it briefly uh, um, and then um, and then uh, I think you'll see if you're ready for a vote on this. So on slide three, um, board members expressed um, an interest in an effort to develop what really amounts to a data strategy and also visioning around the balance between public and private investment in the VHI and um, seeing these as important guideposts for the development of the next comprehensive five-year strategic plan. Uh, those, uh, those, those comments and those concerns uh, um, have uh, been addressed in this revised plan. We also received verbal public comments at the November 17th meeting, and that centered around uh, consumer representation and provider input into the HIE plan and connectivity criteria, with concern about cost of uh, subscription services being passed on to consumers and consumer access to the VHI related to ease of access through one portal. Uh, we did not receive any written public comment. So on November 17th, um, I'm sorry, after the November 17th presentation to the board, um, the HIE plan was resubmitted and uh, the, the, the changes or the updates um, are summarized here, essentially that the HIE plan um, and the HIE steering committee will work to validate that goals and objectives for the health information exchange uh, in Vermont represent the needs and interests of health system stakeholders, that um, it further develops the vision for sustained public investment in the health data exchange infrastructure and opportunities for private investment, and uh, review the reviewing the HIE steering committee membership and governance structure just to make sure that the essential roles are filled and that the structure in the organization really emboldens the progress that uh, that uh, the um, the HIE steering committee is looking to make going forward, um, particularly because this is uh, this is a, a a transition year really. Um, in uh, next year's uh, update, it's really going to be a comprehensive, it's going to be the next five-year plan. And so this is a really great opportunity to just make sure that um, that the structure in the organization um, is, is really um, solid. Uh, also addressing HIE governance in Vermont um, and uh, developing a data strategy to provide consistently updated description of how and why data elements are aggregated and shared through the central data repository, which is the Health Information Exchange. And just, I just want to say a little bit about the data strategy thing. It's it's a it's a common term, 
and it is um, used commonly in uh, in the the comprehensive data space. And it can be designed uniquely, but there are common elements to it. So when we talk about a data strategy, what we're really addressing in a sort of a general sense is is that there's there's a, a written document that addresses the needs and the requirements of the, the health data system uh, with goals and objectives, including stakeholders and how those stakeholders are engaged. Uh, and, and um, you know, addressing the technology infrastructure requirements, how to take that data and, and turn it into information that's information that's understandable to the general public. And um, of course, data governance is a part of that. And, and finally, um, a data strategy includes like a roadmap. So, so some, some, some way that you can see data is ingested, data is used, data is shared um, and, and a timeline for that. So that's kind of a rough sketch of what we mean when we say data strategy, what that data strategy will look like as developed by the HIE steering committee and, um, and vital going forward uh, will, will be unique to, uh, to us here in Vermont. Um, and the, in, the intent is, I think, to um, to foster a, a closer relationship between the HIE Steering Committee and the Green Mountain Care Board's Data Governance Council. So there is some interest in uh, in understanding progress going forward through the year, and we thought that that would be a, a good opportunity for the Data Governance Council to engage um, and provide. Uh, um, the feedback and and allow for that discussion to take place. So, this is a super quick reminder of the principles uh, that we use for the HIE plan review, just to make sure that um, it aligns with statute and whether the HIE plan meets the goals of other recent um, relevant legislation, whether the HIE plan incorporates national be best practice and stakeholder input. We do think that um, it, that the HIE plan as uh, revised and resubmitted uh, is, um, it has been strengthened in these areas. To that end, uh, the staff recommend approving the revised 2021 update to the Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan as resubmitted on December 8th. And uh, there also, we also need to um, remember that we've got the uh, V high connectivity criteria to vote on. Um, and we use two principles for the board's annual review on that. And that's focusing on alignment with the HIE plan goals and clarity of the criteria themselves. There was no additional comment on the connectivity criteria uh, since um, we uh, presented last time on November 17th. And to that end, uh, the staff recommend that the board approve the 2021 connectivity criteria as submitted in the 2021 update. That's it for me. Russ, can this be done in one motion or does it require two? Uh, I think you could do it in one motion. Robin, do you want to take a crack at it? Sure. Um, I move that we approve the revised 2021 update to the Health Information Exchange Strategic Plan as resubmitted on December 8th and approve the 2022 connectivity criteria as submitted in the uh, revised update to the plan. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. I'll open it up for board discussion and I will throw it open to public comment before we vote. So any member of the board at this time? I just have one quick quick question. I thought in what we saw at our last meeting on this that there was a, a phrase in there uh, on a timeline to begin to enumerate the types of socially social determinants of health that were going to be, you know, um, ac activated in a way, you know, on um, 
And I, did, I didn't see any of that mentioned in the slides that you just presented. Yeah, so uh, that that is addressed in, um, albeit a, a, more, a more general sense, in the update to the plan. Uh, and we thought that um, a good a good place for that to happen would be with the Data Governance Council, which is why I mentioned that um, there, there would be more engagement. So rather than the HIE steering committee coming back to the board, say in three months or six months with, uh, um, with social determinants of health enumerated um, and, and other specific uh, requests from the board that we they would work with the Data Governance Council and the Data Governance Council could provide an update to the board um, as needed. Any other board questions or discussion? No, if thank you, all. Kate. You did a, you did a great job, and uh, my concerns were addressed in the update. So, hearing none, I'm going to open it up for public comment. Is there any member of the the public who wishes to comment? Ham Davis. Yes, thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm, I'm puzzled about the, the the whole data situation thing and the. October 27th uh, consultants report uh, that was very important, the one on sustainable, based on the sustainability project. Um, they had the hospital costs, they had hospital costs, for example, but they had no doctor costs. What I'm curious about is uh, back in the 1980s, 1984, uh, the state health department had almost complete data on hospital spending. Now that does that's not all healthcare spending, but it had it had certainly had all the doctor numbers in it, and it was it formed the basis for the Dartmouth Health Atlas, which is one of the most important references. In 1980, in 1980, the um, the state of Vermont could track every virtual virtually every single number that went through hospitals using these Jack Weinberg small area variations technique. Do we need that now? What, I, I don't, we have this huge bureaucratic blizzard of stuff, but what, is, what uh, uh, do we need to have in Vermont? It seems like if we're gonna have a, a state that is genuinely moved to the forefront of reform and gets to, and, and, gets, and gets really the change from, really shifts from fee-for-service to capitation, and then begins to look at all kinds of questions that result in that on the performance of the delivery system itself. Then what are we? What are you? What are we looking for here? I, I'm. I'm. I think that we we need to go back to the uh, Wenberg data. It was. I think it's far more comprehensive than what we have now. Does anybody agree with that? My understanding of the Dartmouth Atlas, and maybe if Sarah Lindbergh is still here, she could chime in, is that it's Medicare only. So that information, I think we still have. Um, but, and, the, and I'll, I see Sarah, so I'll pass it to her because she knows way more than me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think, um, in my opinion, Mr. Davis is right on the nose in that um, that's exactly the type of analyses that uh, we think would help with the board's decision making, and it's definitely in the pipeline. Um, he did just use Medicare, so translating it to all payer uh, methods is uh, something that uh, is under construction. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Kevin, you're muted. <laughs> Hearing no further public comment, um, is there any discussion before we vote on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Kate. Um, Doing a great job taking over for Sarah on this one, and uh, we appreciate it very much. So now we're going to um, turn to um, the all-payer model um, agreement um, 
proposed extension, and I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Kinsler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And now, uh, humble for a minute, get this up on the screen. Uh, like we can barely know. hear you, Sarah. Really? Yep. Is that a little better? It's for, it's better okay. for me. Yeah, I see nodding heads. All right. Um, while I uh, wait for my presentation to load up on the screen, I will just say um, that I also would like to extend my thanks to Kate for um, so ably taking over the HIE plan. Um, all right. The presentation um, is on the screen, so you're all set. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so to introduce myself, um, Sarah Kinsler, uh, GMCB Director of Health Systems Policy, and I am here to um, uh, give an update on the proposal to request a one-year extension of the current APM agreement, and we also have a potential vote noticed for today on this topic. So uh, this slide shows a recap of um, where we have been so far on this. On December 1st, Ina Backus and I were before the board to describe a proposed request to extend the current APM agreement by one year through 2023. I have um, linked the materials that we walked through at that meeting on this slide. Uh, as discussed at that meeting, this proposal doesn't intend to replace a proposal for a longer term subsequent agreement, likely for a standard five year term, but it does give us some more time, especially in light of COVID-19 and the pressures facing the healthcare system and especially our providers to do meaningful engagement about what that next agreement could look like. Um, so since the first, we've had one suggested addition to the materials we shared then. Um, and actually, it, it would not be a point of discussion around the proposed extension, but a waiver that we um, are stating our intent to request under the current agreement language. Um, and this, this proposal would allow Medicare uh, reimbursement for a broader set of master's level clinicians, specifically those who provide mental health and SUD treatment services. Um, and it would also be in line with the providers that Medicaid reimburses. Um, this has been uh, something that has been floated a number of times and has been discussed by the Vermont signatories and stakeholders of, um, to the model. Um, and I know that Ina Backus is in attendance today uh, and can speak to any specific questions that board members might have around this addition. Um, I've also linked here uh, the updated request letter, which is also in the meeting materials uh, on our website. Um, so in terms of proposed next steps, if the board approves moving forward, the draft request letter will be finalized and submitted before the end of the year. Um, I do want to stress that this would be the start of negotiations between the state and CMMI around a one-year extension. So we would be back before the board sometime in 2022 with a legal document uh, developed kind of, you know, out of whatever we negotiate, um, which we would be asking the board to consider and on which we'd be uh, soliciting public comment and, and engaging stakeholders. Um, as we said last week in response to questions, we'd be looking to move forward fairly quickly, or not last week, on the first, I guess, uh, in response to questions, we'd be looking to move forward fairly quickly on these negotiations so that we could shift our attention to the longer term renewal, which we recognize will be a big lift. Um, this slide summarizes the public comment that we have received so far. Uh, we received three at the December 1st board meeting. Uh, we have one written comment from Alan Oxfeld, uh, which is posted to our website um, as we, we traditionally do. Um, and that is all. So here I have listed um, a staff recommendation. Uh, the language is to request a one year extension of the current all pair model agreement as presented on December 1st with the addition of language regarding mental health and substance use disorder treatment providers presented on December 15th, 2021. Thank you, Sarah. Do any board members have questions for Sarah? I don't have a question, but I would just comment um, on the mental health and substance use disorder treatment um, issue. I, th I think it's great to include this because as we know, and as was recently heard from health healthcare, where you know, there's just a real need right now. And so allowing Medicare folks to have broader access through an expanded uh, type of licensing clinicians, I think would be a real benefit for Vermonters. It, if I might add, it all, it's also in line with our all pair model agreement targets for, for population health and quality. And, and more importantly, it's in line with the stories that we're hearing from the field about uh, 
the increased pressures due to the pandemic on these areas. And, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, something that we're going to have to deal with. So um, are there other board comments or questions? Hearing none, um, I'll open it up for uh, public comment. Does any member of the public wish to comment on the um, proposal for the um, extension? Walter? Uh, just thanks to Robin for bringing up that mental health um, issue. Um, <clears throat> we all know practitioners in the field and they just scream about how shorthanded they are. That's all for now. <laughs> if only we could magically produce more. <laughs> well, Robin's right on that one. Yep. Is there other public comment? Hearing none, um, Robin, would you like to make a motion? I would. Um, I move that the board uh, support a request for a one-year extension of the current all-pair model agreement as presented on December 1st, 2021, and also that the um, cover letter include the request to add um, to, that the cover letter include the request regarding mental health and substance use disorder treatment providers um, as presented today. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further board discussion? I'll just briefly note, I think I said this on the first when we talked about it, that I think there has been some confusion around um, the continuation of the agreement and uh, whether or not we have Medicare uh, participating ACOs in the state. And so I just want to, again, emphasize that to me, the having the state have some say in the Medicare ACO programs and in the direction that Medicare is going is important because I think even sh if we didn't have an agreement, uh, you know, we certainly are seeing Medicare ACOs entering the market, um, even absent those which are uh, focused on the APM. Okay. Other board comments? Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. So don't go too far because next we're going to move to a discussion on the fiscal year 22 One Care Vermont uh, ACO budget and certification. And I'll turn it over to Sarah, Marissa, and um, Michelle. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and board members. Uh, Sarah has uh, delegated today's uh, presentation to uh, myself, Marissa Melamed, and Michelle Degree. Um, we also do have the full team here. As you all recall, we went through a full comprehensive uh, presentation of our uh, analysis of the FY22 ACO budget and certification last week, and we're back um, this week to go over a few issues um, that remain from last week uh, and some updates to our recommendations. So Michelle and I are going to present those, um, and we can take um, questions on them um, as well as we have the, the whole team if needed. Um, there's no vote uh, noticed or expected on this today. Um, it's just to bring these updates um, before you and the public, um, and we have a, a vote expected or noticed, um, I should say, for uh, next week on the 22nd. I'm going to go ahead and share our slides. Just give me a second.
and we see them. Great, thank you. All right. Just a minute to catch up there. Okay, so just um, quick introduction. We did not receive any additional uh, public comment between last week and this week to consider, um, but the updates that we're presenting to you today are based on the board discussion from last week. Um, some clarifying information that was received by, um, by us from OneCare, um, which you'll see in the presentation. Um, and we have some staff identified clarifications that we will discuss. So the first one is around uh, really the heart of our uh, recommendation, uh, new recommendations this year. So on 12-8, we presented this recommendation that you'll see up on the screen around the implementation of an ACL benchmarking system. Um, we had some uh, staff level discussion uh, and wanted to um, provide some more specificity around this uh, recommendation based on the conversation that was had. Um, so we've edited this recommendation to more clearly state the objective um, of what we're trying to accomplish and to provide that specificity. So the updated recommendation here is a little longer, but I think it's um, clear. And I'm actually going to go ahead and read it um, because it's you know possible not everyone has had a chance to take a look at this. So the updated recommend recommendation is that OneCare must implement a reputable and effective ACO benchmarking system to compare key quality, cost, and utilization metric, metrics to national benchmarks, utilizing OneCare claims data and potentially clinical data and acquiring data from third-party sources as needed. The benchmarking system and data source must be approved in advance by Green Mountain Care Board staff built for each payer program and include national benchmarks regional if available, and identify best practices based on the data in five key areas. Uh, one, utilization. Two, cost per capita. Three, patient satisfaction and engagement. Four, quality. And five, evidence-based clinical appropriateness. The benchmarking system will allow the ACO and the Green Mountain Care Board to assess one care's performance against peer ACOs or integrated health systems enhance OneCare's ACO level performance management strategy, including implementation of processes and programs that have been implemented at best practice sites and integration of these priority opportunities in the OneCare quality evaluation and improvement program and improve ACO regulatory reporting and performance assessment by providing the benchmarking comparisons to targets at least quarterly to the Green Mountain Care Board. Implementation of the benchmarking system shall start with the Medicare program in FY22 as a test year. OneCare must select and propose the Medicare benchmarking system for GMCB staff approval by April 1, 2021 and present the Medicare proposal as well as a plan for Medicaid and commercial benchmarking systems at the revised budget presentation in spring 2022. Monitoring dashboards and targets will be developed by Green Mountain Care Board staff in collaboration with OneCare and specified in the updated ACL reporting manual. The updated ACL reporting manual will be modified by Green Mountain Care Board staff to streamline reporting requirements to be more focused, sorry, to be focused more on results of the benchmarking system. So again, the heart of this recommendation is to help us move towards um, uh, more of a results-based reporting um, based on data and national benchmarks. Um, this is not um, new. Uh, the, the desire to implement some sort of performance dashboard to allow us to evaluate um, ACO performance has been part of the discussion for the past several years. Um, we engaged with a, a consultant to help us uh, formulate this recommendation and between uh, last week's discussion and uh, a little bit more internal work, this is where we've landed on that recommendation. Moving uh, along to the next one, um, we received some comments. I think um, these came from board member Holmes during last week's meeting. Um, I, I think these are pretty straightforward, but just wanted to highlight what the changes were to expectations for OneCare's revised budget presentation in the spring. Um, board member Holmes recommended that we include 
uh, like I mentioned before, H, which is the status of the ACL benchmarking system by pair program. So it's kind of in here double now. Um, I is um, an update on the results of evaluations as described in the FY22 budget submission, um, including care coordination and, and analysis of variations in care by HSA, which were two evaluations that were mentioned in the budget submission. Um, as well as an update on the partnership between One Care and the University of Vermont, um, the academic institution, to explore additional partnerships around evaluation. I and J are really both um, uh, uh, the re the requirement to come in and talk about um, One Care's evaluation program. So those were suggested updates um, to call out specifically for the presentation, um, which we felt fit with our staff recommendations. So we have included them. Um, and finally, this is really just um, to be kind of aligned with the benchmarking recommendation for accuracy, but we um, updated the recommendation around the um, operating expenses um, that they must not exceed the 15.3 million in the proposed budget, um, plus the cost of the third party benchmarking system um, as required in the, I, I believe it'll be condition one, but we'll fill that in later following approval by Green Mountain Care Board staff. Um, and this has been estimated um, at under $100,000. Um, but again, it's subject to approval um, by board staff. So those are the three uh, recommendation updates that I'm gonna talk about. And I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle Degree to talk about the value-based incentive fund discussion and recommendations. Thanks, Marissa. Um, I'm just going to adjust my volume here. Okay. Um, can you all hear me okay? Okay. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm Michelle Degree. I'm a health policy product director here at the Green Mountain Care Board. And as Marissa said, I'm going to walk through um, what the staff have come up with for the value-based incentive fund discussion um, and sort of our, our recommendation at this point point. Um, I will say that um, while all of the recommendations are no easy feat, this one certainly took a toll on the staff and we worked pretty hard to come up um, with it. And you'll see that ultimately we landed on um, sort of offering the board two potential avenues. That's not to say that there couldn't be more. Um, so I'll sort of walk through um, the way that we got to, to those recommendations. So Marissa, if you could move to the next slide for me. So again, this is a slide from last week, uh, just reminding you of the four sort of programs. Um, and we are focusing today on the value-based incentive fund. Um, so again, last week staff had noted um, that we were likely to increase uh, to suggest an increase to this funding stream just based on the reduction as seen in the budget. Um, and as Marissa mentioned throughout the past week, uh, we received clarification on some existing funding streams and um, that are tied to quality. And I'll sort of review those with you uh, in the next couple of slides. Um, so Marissa, you can 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 Mar
a great deal of information into the most digestible format that we could come up with. Um, so this is comparing, um, you'll see in the columns, uh, 2021 budget to 2022 budget amounts in the programs that are specifically tied to quality performance. Um, so I'll sort of walk through. So we've got it broken down by the different categories or in your rows. So you have the pre-funded value-based incentive fund. You have the quality accountability at settlement. So that goes back to the settlement conversation that we had with the payer panel um, at the end of November. And then you have the population health management investments that are linked to quality outcomes specifically. That's sort of a, a newer change for this year um, in lieu of the changes to the care coordination program. So I'll try to walk through them the best I can. But I think what staff decided to do was really note on this slide the key takeaways from each of those three programs. So for the pre-funded VBIF sort of in its name, it's pre-funded. That is a fixed amount. It's much more timely and it's linked to one cares clinical priorities for the quality accountability at settlement the numbers on your screen here is is max available funding at settlement so there is the potential to to not meet this threshold too so i just i want to flag that and also note that those are budgeted amounts and again if you'll recall we just did 2020 settlement so what you're looking at here is the amount for the for the program year that we're in but won't be realized until late in the following year, which is a which is a point in the key takeaway. So it's a variable amount. Again, it's based on um, the the score earned. Uh, there's 12 or more months ish. Uh, it can be up to 12 months removed from from that performance. And this specifically, as you're aware, is linked to payer contract measures. And it additionally has so there's 10 70% payer contract, 10% is tied to the performance improvement program, um, and that's 10% of the settlement. And the performance improvement program has two measures specifically. Those are cost per capita and avoidable ED utilization. And then the other 20% uh, can be voted on by one cares board. Um, and then for the PHM investments linked to quality and outcomes, again, this is a fixed amount. It's a pre-funded amount. So it's much more timely, just like the VBIF. And this is specifically linked to care coordination measures. I will note that those measures per the budget submission are not yet defined. Um, I think probably given just the, the general uh, kind of world that we're in right now, but I'll, I'll let um, one care speak to that. I think I saw that Sarah Barry was on the line, so I don't want to... Uh, speak out of turn, but I, I think it's it's very likely just due to needing to kind of have committees define those measures um, and be able to set those in place. So we didn't see those in the budget and um, are not aware of what those measures are at this time. Um, so I think just to sort of show you here the difference between the 2021 and the 2022 budgeted amounts and the overall change. So you see there is an increase of $154,044 uh, between the two years. I will say that the higher overall potential earning is possible, but the, there's a actual smaller pre-funded amount if you if you do the math um, than in fiscal year 21. So because that variable amount, so the settlement amount goes up between the two years. So that's really where you're seeing sort of that change. Um, I'll give folks another second to look at this. I know there's a lot of information. Um, and then Marissa, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So based on the information that we have worked on from our last uh, from our last presentation, sort of revisiting the budget, um, we came up with two recommendations to bring to the board. So the first recommendation is that in fiscal year 2022, one care must fund the VBIF and at amount greater than or equal to the fiscal year 21 dollar amount, which as you'll recall was $2.24 million to be reflected in the final budget submission due in the spring, just because we know that um, some of that is tied to uh, payer negotiations. So we wanna make sure that we let all of that sort of flow through and we ask them to see that in the spring. Uh, and option two is kind of not really recommending a condition here. It's just saying based on the information that we received in response to our last board meeting, we could leave the line item as is in the budget, which again is the million dollars, and continue to monitor those total quality incentives available, um, as you saw in the last slide, which is 
greater than the total amount available last year um, by about $154,000. So sort of continue monitoring how those investments flow and being uh, less strict about the, the line item for VBIF. Um, so those are the two sort of extremes, I guess, where staff, staff landed. Uh, Marissa, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, I'll just close us out since I'm here. So uh, again, we have presented to you on December 8th. Uh, this is sort of the, the wrap up of our staff recommendations. Next week, we have a vote noticed. And so any conversation that comes from today's presentation on our updated recommendations and any incorporation of public comment that we receive um, by that time, uh, which I believe we noticed until the 17th. I'm looking at Marissa for a nod or a... Okay, yes, uh, to be able to incorporate any feedback that we receive through public comment at that time. And we'll come back to the board next Wednesday with any changes to these recommendations for a potential vote. Um, just a reminder that the vote needs to occur uh, before December 31st, 2021. Um, the, green is, the green highlight is deceiving. We were joking about this yesterday. It makes it look like we're not very far along, but I promise we're we're nearing the end, we're, we're getting there. Um, and so Marissa, I think the next slide is just public comment. Yep. So I'll, I'll stop there and turn it over to you, Chair Mullen, for any questions or comments from the board and the public on, on the updates that we provided today. Thank you, uh, Michelle and Marissa. Um, at some point, I, I before we go to public comment, I'm gonna wanna hear from uh, OneCare on their thoughts and board members, if you want to um, ask any questions now or any comments now, feel free. Otherwise, you can wait till after we hear from One Care. I'll just make a comment because I'd be interested in One Care's reaction to my comment. Um, so I'll make it now. Um, to me, I think what I would be interested in understanding is. Um, why we wouldn't want to double down on quality in this particular year, given what we know about the pandemic and the impacts of the pandemic and the fact that, um, you know, as discussed earlier, the risk is relatively low, but we do know that quality is really at risk. Um, so I'll just state that I personally would be inclined to level fund the quality in the VBIF or an equivalent amount in a different program if that makes more sense. Like, I don't feel like I necessarily, what uh, that I personally might know the best program, but to me, the important features of the VBIF is that we know what it's tied to already before we enter into 2021, which means the providers know what they're working towards. It's pre-funded, so uh, one of the big complaints I've always heard from providers is the quality incentives don't work if they're a year after you've already given the care. Um, and and so uh, that's those aspects of the VBIF, I think, are a stronger incentive. Um, I'm willing to be told I'm wrong about that for sure, but uh, those were my thoughts that I just wanted to share. Any other board member thoughts or questions before I ask one care for their comments? Uh, <clears throat> go ahead, Jess. I went first last time. Go ahead, Tom. Um, I have uh, just one. I The slides having to do, the last time we met, having to do with benchmark, you know, include the phrase, less Green Mountain Care Board focus on granular budget line items, more focus on results. And so that's a, a broad statement. Um, I am generally supportive of uh, results-based budgeting and, and, and the benchmarking effort, but I also agree it's a, it's a two-way street that um, one reason for moving there is to make the overall operation more efficient, our operation. And so um, just kind of from my perspective, just um, saying to the ACO, if you see areas that you think uh, we're asking efforts of you that um, uh, aren't kind of consistent with a benchmarking um, approach. Let us know. I mean, it's it's uh, it's very hard for people to let go sometimes of of in a budgeting process of what they're used to, 
and we're used to where we've been so far, but we're trying to make it uh, turn the corner here and want to do that with you. And you will have the insights on the other side of the table as to things that you might suggest we let go of. Hey, Jess. Yes. Yeah, I'm just going to say I'm hoping to hear from One Care a little bit more detail around that 982,000, um, specifically a little bit more about the outcomes that are going to be tracked there. Uh, how much of those are related to clinical care? That's what I'd like to know. So I do see that uh, Sarah Berry has her hand up. Are you going to uh, speak on behalf of One Care, Sarah? Yes, Chair Mullen, thank you. And I wanted to start um, both by recognizing uh, Board Member Pelham's comments and appreciating that that in combination with the work that the staff to the Green Mountain Care Board have done over the last weeks to really dig deep into some complex information is greatly appreciated by One Care. And we also are appreciative of kind of the spirit of trying to make sure that the information that we produce and provide is really helping the overall system and ultimately helping Vermonters, not, you know, kind of creating more work for one care to generate and, and the staff and the board to review without necessarily a, a direct correlation with improvements in, in care or outcomes. So thank you very much for that. I did want to start um, by just recognizing that, you know, the ACO as a provider led reform effort um, is really guided by provider feedback and a need to evolve programs and policies at a pace that we feel we can maintain our provider participation and continue to increase accountabilities. So we've spoken before about kind of the, the foundation being set over the first years of the model, and now One Care is very focused uh, through its governance process and in conversation with providers about clarifying and holding our network to specific accountabilities. The challenge in all of this from our standpoint is that if we move too fast or too hard, we will lose a significant portion of our network, um, which will obviously directly impact scale, one of uh, the state's key goals in this area. And so really what we're trying to do is find that sweet spot and recognize that that sweet spot can move a little bit from year to year as we work to both evolve quality, but to do it while also thinking about our overall population health management investments and our risk models. So really wanting the board to hear from us that we are thinking about all three of those things and how to move them forward in a path that really can um, get us hopefully beyond the pandemic and into the pathway that we all want to be on for realizing you know, true large scale accomplishments with value-based care transformation. With respect uh, to quality specifically, I just wanna acknowledge that I think we caused some confusion in the larger environment uh, with our label around the value-based incentive fund because we have evolved its meaning over time. And so what we mean by it today uh, really gets to some of the core tenants that board member Lunge was speaking about in terms of being specific and measurable uh, and timely. And so that is where we are focused on those four key quality measures and feel like the timeliness of uh, incentive in relation to the data and the performance expectations is critically important. At the same time, we had some pretty intensive conversations with our um, our provider network this summer about an equally important investment in care coordination. And when asked to make some really tough decisions about where those priorities should be set and how to align them, there was a feeling that uh, Vermonters that are eligible for the complex care coordination program are amongst the most vulnerable um, in general and probably even more so because of the pandemic. And so it was felt that trying to maintain that at the optimal level, given the reduction in you know, state and federal funding to support these efforts was really uh, the best place for us to have a positive impact as we look at 2022. So with that, you know, I would say that, you know, we wish there was more funding available and more opportunity, whether that be through, um, you know, state and federal funding sources, through payers, through others to be able to invest more in the value based incentive program. But this is really where we felt there was a reasonable threshold for 2022. And in tandem, as um, Michelle described, what we've chosen to do is to allocate almost a million dollars into the quality uh, incentive as part of the care coordination program. So there were a couple of questions about that that I wanted to address. The first, I wanna make sure that it's clear that those dollars, that 982,000 goes to primary care as well as the continuum of care. 
so folks like home health and our designated agencies. We were hoping to have the measures set this month um, so that they were ready to go, but uh, some of our provider associations have asked us for a little bit more time given some of the workforce challenges that they're having, and we felt that was reasonable to continue working with them in January to accomplish that goal. To give you an example of the conversations, we're trying to work to customize where each segment of our network can have the greatest impact. So for example, uh, the quality indicators or outcomes that we might track with our designated agency partners are likely to focus on mental health measures under the all-payer model, whereas in our home health agencies, uh, it's very likely that it might look at more their ability to help us avoid um, unnecessary utilization of the emergency department or to keep people out of the hospital, you know, in the course of uh, receiving skilled care. So we'd be happy to report those specifically back to you um, in, you know, the month of January or thereafter as they're, they're described. But I think overall, we come very close um, to that investment in terms of uh, if you were to compare the value-based incentive fund for 2021 to the two components that are being paid in a timely manner in 2022, being the population health management quality uh, investment related to care coordination, as well as the VBIF. Um, with respect to the benchmarking, I, I just want to comment that I think there is still some opportunity for clarity about the multitude of uses uh, for such a tool, and that I recognize that one of those uses is really through a regulatory lever um, in thinking about the ACO's performance relative to other ACO's nationally. Um, and then there are others that are really more within the purview of the provider network and how they want to receive data and be able to look at best practices. And so, you know, we're really looking for um, opportunity to continue to improve and to continue to focus on one of our core capabilities around data and analytics, but also doing it in a way that is really provider led and provider directed around how they want to spend the resources um, and how they want to focus those efforts. So I think I'll stop there and I'm more than happy to answer any follow-up questions um, if I didn't get to them or if any further came up from my comments. Do board members have any clarifying or follow-up questions? I, I Thank you, Sarah, That that's very helpful. Um, I, I would say that um, certainly should the board choose to go in the direction of uh, requesting an increase in the quality uh, components. Um, personally, I would not expect that to be an, at the ex expense of um, other programs. So I think you'd have to find that funding from a revenue source in some way. And I personally wouldn't necessarily dictate how you do that. Um, whether that comes from settlement dollars or, you know, whatever, I don't care. Um, but I'll just say that certainly that would be my intent just to express it. And I, I certainly understand you're trying to balance different components of your budget and and uh, kind of meet where you think you're going to land in your payer contracts. Yeah, thank you, Board Member Lunch. I think I would just comment in return that, um, you know, the challenge for us, I understand that that the board's responsibility is to look at the entire system. Ours at One Care is to look at what's within the purview of the ACO. And so we have a, a limited budget and limited resources that have become um, much more constrained through, you know, the loss of, of delivery system reform and HIT. And so I, I just think it's challenging, as we all know, you know, given the times that we're in and would ask for, you know, kind of some grace in that process around making sure that we can keep supporting our network as lean as we are um, without putting more constraints on them at this point in time. Are there any other further clarifying or follow-up questions? If not, thank you, Sarah. Do board members have any um, comments at this time? Hearing I, none, I'm gonna... Oh, sorry, Robin, I didn't mean to cut you I off. I was deciding whether or not to jump in again or not. Uh, but I think, you know, for me, um 
I certainly understand the financial pressures and the loss of the state dollars, although we knew those were coming. We've known that since the beginning of uh, the last uh, global commitment waiver that those dollars are being phased out over time. Um, and uh, I'll just say personally, um, I do think uh, having increased dollars in quality is important to me. So I am likely to support the staff recommendation uh, for that additional amount. Um, I'm willing to leave it up to one care as to whether to invest that through the VBIF or the care coordination program. Um, to me, you know, the core tenants that I said before, the, the important parts that it's, um, you know, clear to providers what they're working towards, that they get that those dollars in a timely fashion, et cetera. So I think if we were to not be as specific, but to kind of lay out those components, that would satisfy me. I'd want to be clear that that money should not come out of other programs. Um, and also, I, I think it's just important to note that by doing so, we're not trying to dictate any particular result at any payer negotiation. That's obviously, we leave that to the payers and the providers, but that this is, uh, you know, uh, an important part of the program. Hey, other board uh, comments? Hearing none, I'm gonna open it up for public comment. I'm gonna call on Dale Hackett. So first of all, Robin, thanks. I totally thank you for making those comments. I think that's really important. Um, secondly, I'm still a bit puzzled. Um, can somebody help explain? You, you've got provider-led, but you got a shortage of providers. You to cut down on ED visits, but because you've got a shortage of providers and people really can't get in to get doctor's appointments, they may actually call up and be told to go to the emergency room department because they can't get a doctor's appointment. How does this how does this work from how the data gets recorded? when it's type of scenario for one care because they were talking about cutting down on ed visits and so something clicking here as far as i get the goal but is it realistic so dale you were cutting out a little bit on my end if i think what you're suggesting is that because there's a, a problem with access that there's more demand on uh, emergency visits. And um, maybe staff heard more of what you said. Um, if you did, feel free to, to answer, uh, Dale. But unfortunately, uh, I, I had him cutting out quite a bit. Marissa, Michelle, did you hear what he had to say? now or no okay sorry Marissa sorry. do you go ahead Michelle I don't know Marissa looked like she was trying to unmute I think we're both deep in thought about her spot. Um, so I think I, I, if I'm understanding correctly too, I also heard how do we sort of balance what seem to be positive indicators of quality being things like reduce um, ED visits with things like pent up demand in the system and having high wait times. Um, and that's a really good question. And I think, um, you know, we'll continue to monitor all of this through our all pair model like federal reporting, and I think one care will have to do its due diligence at sort of monitoring that as well. I think the other thing that always comes into play here that we have to weigh is as as scale changes, the population tied to the ACO also changes, and so we are also always aware of sort of that shift um, and kind of following those participants' risk levels, 
and keeping all of that in mind as we continue to monitor and measure. So I know that's not a, a super straight answer to your question, Dale, but it's um, what comes to the top of mind. Um, so I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop there. Thank you. OK, I'll call on Walter Carpenter. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, just wanted to back up what Robin said about quality. She's already said it, so I won't say it again. And I also wanted to ask Michelle, um, will the ACO actually mitigate wait times at some point? And then there's a comment on the public comments about the One Care budget by a G. Richard Dundas. And he asks, please show us the evidence that the value of care has improved since One Care began operating. And I just wanted to ask if that is, is possible. Because so far we have long wait time. We all know we have long wait times, etc. Quality value has it improved. Michelle, you want to take a crack at that since you're the uh, the measure of quality? <laughs> sure. Uh, so I think a couple of things just to 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 flag and note that another piece that I didn't mention in my prior comment was timing of this, right? So if we're using claims data as the the basis for most of our measurements, some of this takes time. I think a big piece of what you're speaking to, Walter, is we have to consider the pandemic, right? So this is this is a huge uh, potential kind of doing the research now, but what demand did that cause in the system versus what demand was already there? Um, and in addition, you know, we the the provider sort of shortage, if you want to call it that, you know, from from all of the other research that's going on in the state, you know, that's not ultimately one cares problem to solve. That's going to be sort of a collective effort between a lot of state partners, I think. Um, so I, I think it looks like Sarah Kinsler has something that she might want to add. So I'll, I'll turn to, to her. Um, but that's sort of just the, the basis that I would say in, in responding um, to your questions. And I, again, I know it's sort of a higher level answer, but I, I can't give you can't give you great details at this point, unfortunately. Well, I, I I think the part of the issue I hear is that these problems were going on before the pandemic. There was a physician shortage before the pandemic, and the pandemic, of course, has just exacerbated all of the problems that were there before it came along. Sarah, did you want to add? Sure, um, and I, I completely concur with Michelle on you know all the, the points that she made. Um, to your point on the the physician shortage and the workforce challenges that we're seeing now, Walter, you know these are these are things that we were working on in the state innovation models grant uh, workforce work group and the workforce strategic plan that came out I think in 2013. Um, you know that 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 we put together with um, partners from all over state government. Um, and the public and, you know, so many stakeholder groups, um, you know, so these aren't these aren't new challenges, but they are really significant right now for so many reasons, including the pandemic. Um, and it's going to take, uh, you know, more more than the ACO to um, to crack that nut uh, in terms of. In terms of demonstrating value, as Michelle said, there are, you know, even though we are four years into this model, um, data wise, we are, um, you know, in year two or com coming into mid year three. Um, so so we are we are always going to be a little bit behind as we look at that data and we need to kind of give our give us ourselves time to learn from what we're seeing. That said, um, we've seen um, some of we presented last uh, last week on some of the results that we've seen to date. Um, many are promising, some are mixed. Um, it's clear to us that there are both areas of, uh, of success and areas um, for kind of collective improvement. Um, one of the things that I think it will be really beneficial about the um, monitoring strategy that staff are recommending going forward, um, this kind of tie to national benchmarking and tie to national peers, is that it will help us see more clearly kind of 
what what should we what kind of performance um, could we realistically push for? Um, what kind of standard uh, should we be holding ourselves to in terms of you know what are what are what are the best performers out there doing and how can we make sure that those are our goals? Um, so I think that will just give us another uh, another um, frankly much more timely data tool to have in our pocket uh, as as regulators. Okay, next I'm going to turn. To Sarah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Next, I'm going to turn to Ham Davis. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, the whole issue of quality, it seems to me, is one of the single most important issues in healthcare reform, and has been for a very long time. And that what strike, what bothers me most about it is the very significant aura of unreality that surrounds all the talk about it. For example. There isn't anything that one care can do about health care quality in Vermont. Not a single thing. They don't put on a Band-Aid and they don't prescribe an aspirin. Every issue, every issue of medical quality depends on the performance of the state's 15 hospitals and its 1,900 or so doctors. They're the one, they are the ones that have to do it. Okay. And the question is how you begin to cut it, get into that problem. And the, 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 you, so the, the one care can collect data that you tell them to collect, but that you, they, th that's all they can do. They can collect data. And in the single most important sentence that Sarah Barry said has, is that if her hospitals don't like what she's doing, they won't be part of one care anymore. Think it through. That's reality. Somebody who thinks they can get just sort of maneuver by some sleight of hand to get by that problem is just a waste of time. So the the question is the question is what if you get the data? You, what the one what the board can do is the board can can say we, here's the kind of data we want to see, and you can ask for the data. Okay, uh, but the one the, but what will happen is then you can count on it. OK, is that the people that people will as they put that data together, the issue will be whether if you have a problem with quality that you locate that you'd say, who's the problem? Is it hospital X? Is it Dr. Y? You'll have a huge impulse inside of medicine that's been true for 50 years. OK, the doctors understand perfectly that their performance is 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 mixed. They know they know that. The thing they want last in the world is somebody looking over their shoulder and telling them what mistakes they made. Do you think they really want that? Do you folks want that? Does anybody want that? So the question is how to how to get by this this conundrum. I mean, the the it's not we people. It, it's not that it's really hard. Actually, it, in the in the level of, of the whole quality industry now is still pretty weak. It's mostly filling in boxes. Did you make this telephone call? Did you ask the patient whether he want he, whether he, he he ate this or that? Very little outcomes in there, and even there, you can't get it. For example, I've tried for five years to find out what the level of revision surgery, not return to the OR, which is which is what they want to do because that doesn't tell you anything in Vermont. Revision surgery. This is a real bear. And what I would hope is that the board just doesn't mess any more around with with the, the silliness about it. You, the, the, it's not a matter of money. Every single doctor out there and every single hospital out there is supposed to be watching quality anyway. They don't need more money to watch quality. And all they have to do is report it. The question is whether you're willing to do it. That, that, that was not a question, Kevin. It's kind of a rant. I'm done. Thanks, Sam, because I was prepared to uh, answer your rant, but since it was just a rant, I won't. <laughs> I do disagree slightly, though, Ham, as you might uh, suspect that uh, I me, think. How do you dis disagree how, Kev? I'm well, you, you talked about, you made a statement that uh, um, a hospital might back out um, because they're being looked at on uh, quality. And I would say. Boy, I would not want to be the CEO of the hospital that espouses that they're backing out of this program because they're not uh, meeting quality standards because that's disgraceful. 
So what do you what did you how, how did you interpret what Sarah Barry had to do? I didn't say that. Sarah Barry said it. Well, you repeated it. Well, I know, but I and mean you, you you referred it specifically to uh, quality measures. I think Sarah's was a little bit broader in that um, what she said if uh, um, is if it doesn't make sense, and I don't want to paraphrase what she said, but if it doesn't make sense for the providers, they're not going to participate. But I don't think that um, we'll get, we'll give it her a statement was directly linked to quality, but maybe yeah. I'm wrong. Kevin, I asked Sarah Barry five years ago what the revision surgery numbers were. She said she had them, and I've never been able to get them. The problem is it's too embarrassing, Kevin. I mean, if somebody was, if somebody, if you had to get up every day and somebody was looking right over your shoulder and every time your dog barked when it shouldn't, then they, you just got dumped on. That is a hard, that's a hard, that's a hard thing. It's very hard for medical professionals to do this. And if, if you think they're doing it somewhere, you tell me where it's being done. It's being done, I'll tell you where, nowhere. Name one place. I, I think you're uh, right there that uh, um, it would change um, practices if, if uh, a light was shown on um, quality scores for one provider versus another. You. So, yep. It's, it's super hard. I mean, it's, it's painful. And I'm not saying I know how to do it. I'm just I'm just saying. Until you do that, until somebody can make a direct connection between what's going on in their environment and what they do, until you can make that connection direct, then nothing will happen. It's because people okay. change. It, change is painful. And change people only change if they have to. Okay, next I'm going to turn to Dr. Dean French. Thank you, Chairman Mullen. I thought it would be ironic for a hospital CEO and physician to follow him. Um, you guys need a little humor. Um, actually, I had a real thought, and um, I don't. I just think as we think about all these things, and they're incredibly challenging. Um, but in the front of primary care, it's interesting when you look at Vermont. We actually have a richness of primary care that's um, the envy of most of the rest of the country. In other words, we have a lot of primary care doctors and providers per capita compared to most other places in the country. And the pipeline is fairly robust. What I would note is as we've pushed to try to improve value and improve care coordination, and to Ham's point, measure a lot of process change, uh, what we've seen is that provider panels have shrunk. When I was a practicing family physician in the late 90s, I had 25 to 3,000 patients in my provider panel. The typical primary care provider in Vermont these days has, you know, 1,200 is considered a very large panel. And in, in my health service area, I'm seeing panel sizes of eight, 900. And so effectively, we've cut the number of primary care providers or access points in half because our panel sizes have decreased so much. And you could argue they've decreased because we're spending so much more time on all the things that we think are important to prevent emergency room visits, et cetera. And at the same time, then patients can't get in to see primary care and they can't establish primary care. And of course, the ultimate dumping ground for uh, patients who can't get in is the one place that door is always open and there is no filter, and that's the emergency department, where we find ourselves doing more and more complex care coordination through the emergency department than ever before. And I don't have any answers to any of that, other than I think it's important that we recognize that that exists. And as we try to push the quality dime forward, what are we actually doing in the primary care space that's actually decreasing access? And how do we remedy that? And so I'll stop there, but I just, uh, listening to this conversation, which I think is incredibly important. And just for him, I would say that as a CEO of a hospital, the last thing I wanna see is orthopedic revisions because uh, I lose money on every single one of them. Anyway, thank you and uh, have a good afternoon, folks. Thanks, Dr. French. And I don't think Ham's gonna let you have that last word because I see his hand is raised again. So, Ham. <laughs> well, thank you. And I appreciate Dr. French's comments. 
uh, my, my when I'm just for myself, the I think the problem is not really primary care. The uh, I, I actually one of the problems I'm working on that I have no idea how to do is to figure out how to get to check quality in primary care. But it's only five percent of the cost. The real problems, the the real difficult problems are not primary. It's not that they don't need quality. I don't know how to do it. But it's it is much clearer when you get to when you get to hospitals and that are doing stuff like very complex surgeries. If that can be, we know that can be done. And if you want to change, and, that, and that's 95% of the cost, not 5%. So I just said, is that I appreciate Dr. French's comments. I, and I don't really disagree with him. I mean, the reality is that primary, I don't know how, I don't have a clue how to, to, uh, to judge primary care quality. And I talk to a ton of people and I don't find anybody else that does. But surgery, big surgeries, orthopedics and stuff like that, that is ripe for to 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 make to start to get to a point where you can go to revision surgeries. Revision surgeries is the question in Vermont. If the return to the OR is a big issue at uh, General, General, uh, Mass General Brigham in, in Mayo Clinic, um, uh, Sinai, you know, Mount Sinai in New York huge places. But in Vermont, once you've had a bad result in one place, you're not going back there. Now, Vermont is on. And, the, and so the question is, there's some stuff you could do right today. Revision surgeries. Think about it. Thanks, Sam. Next, I'm going to turn to Robert Hoffman. Hi. Thank you, Chair Mullen. I just wanted to applaud the board's recommendations. Um, if you look at the most recent data on the top 10 ACOs, they're having no problem funding their quality investments because they're making tens of millions in shared savings. Moreover, they can point to how they generate those savings. They can give you hard data that demonstrates it. Uh, this ACO has not been able to do that year after year when asked by both your board as well as the healthcare advocate, how do they do what they do? Um, they always keep it high level because they're not capable of giving you that information. Um, I also want to applaud the uh, resiliency demonstrated member Lunge in pushing back and saying that not only must the, the value based incentive fund be funded, but that it's not going to be taken from another quality investment. Um, these folks, the roughly $1.4 million you're asking them to stretch equates to the additional sa uh, salaries they're taking for employees to do less work. And moreover, it roughly equates to the premium they are paid over the uh, national median salaries for VP, director, and manager level hospital workers. So it's nice to see you all finally uh, demonstrating a little bit of grit and pushing back. And I hope that you all just have the resolve to follow through and do it. Thank you. Hey, is there other public comment? Is there other public comment? And it looks like there's no action uh, to be taken today. So with that, I want to uh, thank uh, Marissa and Michelle for the uh, presentation. And um, as I see it, uh, the next item on the agenda is old business. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing and seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing and seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. For a minute, I didn't think anybody wanted to leave. <laughs> we had uh, three moves, but I'll uh, take one of those as a second. And um, the motion is to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the uh, motion passed unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.